This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. With that, we'll head into our first little mini debate here on the treatment of instant restenosis. It's my pleasure to welcome my co-moderator, Pete Schneider. Pete. Good morning. So um, thank you very much to, uh, to Mike and to Linda and Joe for, uh, for inviting me. It's a real uh, honor and a pleasure to, to participate in this uh, meeting and it's it's typically one where I come away with a lot of um, a lot of new insights and some chances to really run some uh, challenging situations by friends so I'm assuming that Joe was um, behind this idea that uh, that I should be the proponent of endovascular therapy for instant restenosis these are my uh, disclosures so the risk of restenosis really varies uh, when stents are placed in different parts of the body, but there's a big increase, a big jump up in incidence of restenosis in the, um, in the lower extremities. The tibials aren't totally clear, but boy, the SFA sure has been a problem, and it's really a challenge and it's a frustration for me to have these patients in my practice who are only partially treated and where you have this sort of a disappointing sense, oh, it's going to be so-and-so coming back. I'll bet there's going to be a problem uh, with this recurrent instant restenosis. So we know that it's common. We know that um, that long SFA occlusions and certain factors that when you treat them with stents that you're more likely to uh, have instant restenosis, the so-called full metal jacket. And we know there are some associated factors like stent fracture, and there may be things like stent overlap that help to stimulate instant restenosis. I mean, the bottom line is that everyone knows that instant restenosis stinks. So because there's very little chance that I can win this debate, despite the fact that both I and almost everyone I know treat these patients mostly endovascular, I think it'd probably be a good idea to try to divert the audience's attention away from the real issue and uh, toward my opponent. Now, Mike Conti is kind of a hard guy to spoof because he's you know, kind of a serious and thoughtful guy and he, you know, he's a real contributor. And uh, it's hard to come up with very much negative to say. So I decided to go with um, celebrity lookalikes instead. So this is uh, Steven Van Zant, the, uh, the guitarist for the E Street Band, also been on The Sopranos and has a new show on uh, HBO called Lilyhammer, which is hilarious. Uh, and then of course there's the other Mike Conti, the, the kind of the serious and thoughtful kind of channeling Richard Gere in this photo. And then, of course, there's this one. This is the young, the young Mike Conti. I don't know what he's doing here, perhaps maybe in a, a wedding ceremony in The Godfather or something, but here's a young Al Pacino. And I really like the flowers, Mike, such a nice touch, just really terrific. Anyway, so now back to where we were. So instant restenosis, I tell you, the fact that we have so many different treatments for instant restenosis, that alone ought to make you nervous. But you can freeze it, cut it, fry it, dilate it, reline it, all kinds of things. And I just think that just to do uh, in due deference to the assigned task, I think we should dig into this just a little bit, kind of see where we stand right now. So there have actually been two prospective randomized studies comparing balloon angioplasty with other therapies, and these are the two balloon arms in those trials. And I'll get to those trials in a minute, but I just wanted to point out that Although these are not huge trials, the primary patency at 12 months for balloon angioplasty of instant restenosis was very similar between the two, roughly 20 something to 30 something percent at 12 months. Um, and this is, uh, 
This is a, um, a rendition. The, unfortunately, this slide didn't come through, but this is comparing three different types of instant restenosis. And you saw this slide from, from uh, Chris Owens. And what this is saying is, and let me just spend a second on this. So this is 120 patients from Japan with SFA instant restenosis, class one patients were patients that had stenosis in their stent that was very focal, less than five centimeters in length. Class two patients had diffuse stenosis that was more than five centimeters in length. And class three patients had occlusion of the stent. And you can see that the freedom from recurrent restenosis was dramatically different for the class three patients, that is those who presented with an occlusion. Now, all these patients were treated with balloon angioplasty, but they were stratified by how they presented class one, two, or three. Again, class three is the occluded stent. Now, this is a little bit challenging for me, honestly, because we don't know if class three patients really have a different, more aggressive mechanism, or if it's more of a failure of surveillance or failure of the patient to report for duty when recurrent symptoms occur. So just keep that in mind. But clearly, class three appears to be way worse. So in class three, at two years, more than 80% of the patients had uh, recurrent stenosis, and more than 60%, almost two-thirds, had recurrent occlusion. So this work has been um, sort of replicated by the group at UC Davis. And again, you see class one, two, and three. You can see that class three, the presentation with the occluded stent is worse. But in this case, there's a little bit less difference between uh, class two and class three than in the previous study. Again, this is gonna be affected by how closely the patients are followed. But if you look at the risk, not so much of recurrent restenosis, but reocclusion, what you see is that in both studies, the class three patients really stand out. And I think the key thing about this is that these class three patients are bad actors, and these may be the ones where repeated attempts at endovascular therapy are probably a complete waste of time. Now, what about other therapies? There has been a prospective trial looking at cutting balloon angioplasty versus plain old balloon angioplasty, and results were no different, whether it was one, three, or six months. What about debulking for instant restenosis? Well, we've heard quite a bit about excisional atherectomy and also laser atherectomy, and this is the best uh, data that I saw in the literature for, um, ex for silverhawk atherectomy, and this is from Thomas Zeller. Those of you who know Thomas Zeller, I mean, the guy is an amazing technician and has been a strong proponent of atherectomy and one of the main trial PIs for atherectomy. And for instant restenosis, his results are in the range of 50% patency at one year. And again, this is, is his data. And the, the usual scenario after atherectomy is an additional low pressure PTA. But these are real patients with real lesions, 13 centimeters mean. What about laser atherectomy? Well, you sure can get a nice angiographic result with laser atherectomy. Um, we've done plenty of it in our practice. Um, I typically use a, uh, a distal protection filter when I do laser atherectomy uh, because there, there is typically uh, particulate released, sometimes gristle, sometimes thrombus. Um, and here's the result of the patent study. And again, this is TLR here. So this is 52% risk of TLR at 12 months and 43% patency. So you can see that neither of those, either excisional or, or laser atherectomy, although both are a step up from balloon angioplasty, neither of them appear to be the answer. So here's the uh, not yet published, but recently presented Reline trial, which is the Gore endoprosthesis versus PTA. This is the PTA group I showed you before. And you can see that the claim here is a significant jump up or increase or improvement in 12 month patency by relining a stent that's been um, stenotic or occluded due to instant restenosis. And this is the literature that I could find on stent graft or endoprosthesis relining. All of these are with Viabon. And you can see that the 12-month puts it in the mid-60s 
to the mid-70s in terms of what people are finding. But again, the trials are small. The total number of patients in each trial is, has typically been uh, less than 40. So what about drug-eluting balloons? We're going to hear more about drug-eluting balloons uh, this morning. But there is uh, one publication in the Journal of American College of Cardiology looking at DEB for instant restenosis. Again, these are real lesions, 15 centimeters mean uh, stent length, 83 millimeters uh, lesion length. And the uh, publication is a 90% success rate or patency rate at one year. And again, there's this difference between the class one, class two, and class three, with the rate of recurrent restenosis being the worst in class three and significantly better in class one, and then the class two somewhere in between. This is one other trial looking at drug eluting balloon versus PTA. Again, recently presented this past January, but not yet published, showing that the 12 month recurrent re stenosis rate for PTA was 62 plus percent, and for drug eluting balloon was 29.5%. So again, seems to be some incremental improvement, at least if the data that's been presented stands the test of a fuller evaluation. This is the Zilver PTX registry. Again, we're gonna hear a little more about drug eluding stents, but among the 900 patients in the Zilver PTX registry, 142 of them had instant re-stenosis, or 14% of patients. And this is, uh, was recently presented by Mike Dake, um, one of those 8,000 presentations that, uh, that Chris Owens mentioned and showing that with drug eluding stents for instant re-stenosis, you can get an 80% one year patency rate. So where does that leave us? Well, um, if you just summarize, we saw that PTA alone, although it was functional, uh, was not very successful by the time a year went by and that with cutting angioplasty, there did not appear to be um, an additional advantage, although we lack data with other types of modified balloons. We haven't seen anything with angiosculpt, angioscore, uh, chocolate, and there are a couple of other modified balloons in development. We looked at atherectomy. We know that atherectomy could play a role in debulking uh, in, as an adjunct for some other type of therapy, but as a standalone therapy, it doesn't appear to be the answer. I will say that when I do debulk, I use a distal protection device and typically do capture debris regardless of the type of atherectomy I'm doing. Um, the stent graft claims are pretty substantial and the claim that we are now getting to a, a slightly higher level of improvement. My worries about the stent grafts are things like collaterals where in perhaps the garden variety population of first time treated patients, if you cover a few collaterals, if you may not really find that high risk group that, be, that got into trouble because their collaterals were covered. And yet in this case, these people have already failed therapy once. They've, their leg has survived because of collaterals typically. And so a, a treatment that covers collaterals, I think you just have to be super careful. All the available data is with Viabonds. So that's the other thing to know. And then lastly, DEB and DES. I feel like with DEB and DES, we're seeing these claims and the claims we're seeing are fantastic. I mean, if you can get an 80% one year patency with de novo stenting in patients with claudication, that's, that's industry standard and that's pretty good. And we're seeing those kind of claims with DEB and DES, but it's not yet published and data is accumulating as we speak. So to me, that's really exciting about the possibility for next steps. And, um, uh, but I think it's gonna take a couple of years before we fully understand whether these therapies where you add topical medication are actually an advantage or not. So in conclusion, um, SFA instant restenosis, we have poor results with POBA, cutting doesn't add anything, seems to be a little better with endoprosthesis, and there are promising results with local drug delivery. But also just to remember that in any trial where we really feel like we're learning something, I think we probably need to understand how many patients were class one, class two, and class three ISR, because we know that class three, when it's looked at, is a group of very bad actors. And then um, 
Lastly, I just wanted to say that, you know, once you achieve the uh, status of Mr. Biceps, that, um, you know, you probably think everybody has a good vein. And so you probably think everybody needs a bypass. So I just thought I'd leave you with that thought. And here's a, uh, here's a, a multiple choice question for you. Um, I don't know if we can, can we activate the keypads here? Uh, great, instant restenosis. A, best treated with angioplasty. B, can be treated with any modality and achieve the same results. C, has worse results of treatment when the stent is occluded. And D, occurs with about the same frequency in the SFA as it does in other beds like carotid or iliac. Need some music. Dun, dun, dun. All right, so everybody's paying attention. Mike? So let, let, me, um, let me just introduce Mike. Uh, as you probably feel like you know him too well now that I uh, introduced him in my talk, but uh, Mike is uh, chief here at uh, UCSF Vascular Surgery, and he's going to take the position that maybe we should be doing bypasses on these patients with instant restenosis. Mike? Thank you, Pete. Geez, I don't know how I underestimate you every time, so now I, now I feel like I brought a knife to a gunfight. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, I am going to um, take the alternative position here, and I guess w the first thing I want to do is kind of try to refocus things a little bit away from lesions and target lesions and think about why we're retreating patients and what the clinical situation is, because clearly when we treat patients, uh, we're looking for a certain result, and when we get a failure like this, when we get instant restenosis, we're disappointed and we want to fix it. But the problem is that everything we do has consequences. So rather than just jumping back in there to try to do something else, I think we have to think carefully each and every time about what's going to happen to the patient and what's the, what's the goal. And the goal is not target lesion revascularization. The goal is clinical improvement for the patient. So uh, these are my disclosures. I am involved with uh, some of the drug-coated balloon programs that are in development. So you've already heard a lot of this from Pete. Some of what I'm going to talk about is really some of the same slides, but we know this is a big problem, and we know it's most severe in the infrainguinal vessels. Restenosis uh, after either POBA or stenting is a big problem that we still, you know, in our clinic every single week we're dealing with this. And we know that the strategies we currently have to treat it are perhaps getting better, but they're still in real life. You know, they're pretty limited. I mean, we try these things over and over again. Uh, we do see that there's some promising data that we'll talk about from some of the drug elution trials, but far and away, this, to my, in my mind, remains the biggest problem we see in our everyday practice, patients coming back in with failures of our previous treatments. And some of you have seen this slide before, but suffice to say, from the standpoint of looking at who's getting surgery these days and how it's changed over the last decade, it's changed quite a lot. So by and large, today, if you look at the number of procedures we're doing, and this is about 3,500 cases from, northern, from New England, the proportion of bypass cases that were done after something else had already failed in that leg, be it a bypass or an endo-intervention, has gone from about 20% to about 40%. Now that might be okay, but clearly it tells us that we're treating previous treatment failure almost as much as we're treating native disease. So I think this is true, and I think we all know it's true. Uh, in our current practice, restenosis is probably one of the more common things we're treating week in, week out, and it is a vascular epidemic. And you know, in part, it relates to what we choose to do. And clearly, we need to think carefully about the first treatment because it does have impact, but we also need to think carefully about the next treatment. And I'm not even going to talk about costs in this entire talk, but that's the real thing that's looming over the top of all this is how many times are we going to get paid to redo the same thing? Um, I think, you know, the answer is, we'll see what the answer is, but it's probably not going to be what's happening today. So <clears throat> this is the reality, I think, of treating SFA disease. It's challenging. The results are probably not as good as we would like. Um, we try to march up from minimally invasive to maximally invasive and try to be careful all along the way, but the reality is that we have failure pretty frequently. The best results are clearly uh, with bypass surgery, and then if you start out with just plain old balloon angioplasty and you go through stenting, you can see that our estimated patency of two years is really not that good. You know, less than half of the patients for some, for some of these treatments that we're doing are going to still have a patent vessel two years later. So, 
The good news is I guess we got opportunity to improve. Some of this data you've already seen, this is real life stuff, treating lesions that are 15 centimeters long in the SFA is not uncommon. This is task C uh, disease and you can see this is the group from, uh, this is John Laird's group. Just looking at a modern series, this is 2014. What I'm pointing out here, yes, stenting is better than angioplasty for these lesions, but the 50% failure rate at one year is pretty significant stuff. You know, one out of two. So how many of you in the room tell your patients that? Well, we're going to try this, but half the time you're going to be back in a year and it's not going to work. But that is actually the truth. Um, so we've got a ways to go here. And we've heard about some of the options for treating instant restenosis. Today, we don't yet have in the U.S. The, the, the ability to use drug-coated balloons, but clearly this is something that offers potentially a game changer. In, in fact, it could be a game changer in the whole paradigm. We could go from POBA with bailout stenting to drug-coated balloon and bailout DES. I don't know if that's going to make a big difference, but in reality today, we don't have that option. Repeat stenting with either bare metal or drug-eluting stent, atherectomy, covered stents, or open bypass. This is really the options we have today. And what I want to make you think about is to start out up here, why you're doing it. Because that's really, that's the most important thing. You see the lesion or you see the ultrasound, and you, I got to fix that because, you know, I started this, so I'm going to finish it. But the problem is you're not going to finish it. And, and what's going to happen potentially is some of these patients that started in this revolving door as claudicans are going to spit out on the other end with critical limb ischemia. And that's what we don't want. So first and foremost, we got a problem because we all do ultrasounds but there's actually no good data to support prophylactic reintervention. And the reason is that we haven't done any trials and because the results of the reinterventions are not that good, you have to really question this whole concept. Then of course you gotta think about the patient's risk for whatever you wanna do. Do they have a vein? Are they really a candidate for open bypass? Should you do anything at all? Um, I also have to think about the failure pattern, how often has it already happened and how early is it happening? Because I think early failures are generally bad. P patients who fail early or fail a couple of times, I think you might have to take a deep breath and step back uh, a little bit away from the edge of that cliff. And then of course, the anatomic pattern is critical. We talked about this already, stenosis versus occlusion, the length of the lesion, also how big the vessel is, right? We know that reference vessel diameter is important, not just lesion length. Think carefully, especially with cover stents, as Pete mentioned, about not only risk to collaterals, but extending that stent down into the popliteal artery. That's where I think we start to ratchet up the stakes of the game. And the potential effects on downstream surgical options, costs and resources, I'm not going to show you any data, but we all know it's not good. Bottom line is, instant restenosis, as common a problem as it is, we have no level one data to tell us what to do. There are a few randomized clinical trials that are in the works and we're waiting to see them get published. But you also have to recognize that there's a big provider bias here, right? Because different specialists will have a different threshold about when to convert to open bypass. And, and that's actually a major issue. This is what none of us wants to see, but this is what can happen if we, you know, get carried away. You know, you start extending, stenting down below the knee into the tibial vessels. Uh, this is a patient here who actually started out as a claudicant. You can see that they got bare metal, st they got stented all the way down to the knee joint. Now they got a bypass for critical limb ischemia. Of course, if we had a crystal ball, we would not let this happen. But I think if you think about this situation, it probably wasn't very good judgment to begin with. So we need to try to avoid these circumstances because then we're really salvaging patients from the brink of disaster. Certainly the pattern of restenosis, I think, makes a difference. I'm a little perplexed by this what I would consider a very wide range of class two. I mean, less than five uh, centimeters is, is focal. Occlusion is bad. I think there's a lot in the middle here. And I think if you look at the studies, there's a wide range of what you could expect in the middle. This was the same study. There's so few studies, we're gonna all show the same slides. Um, mean length of these lesions is about 16, so it's reasonable. They define restenosis in, a, in an ultrasound fashion. About a third of these were early, within six months. All were treated by balloon angioplasty. All were treated after angioplasty with only antiplatelet monotherapy. So take all this with, with that as a caveat, whether or not that's the standard that anybody would do. The results have been shown. Clearly, the patients with the class three lesions did not do very well, and they re recurred very quickly and very often. This was really not a very effective thing to do for these patients. I'm a little surprised, actually, that the other two curves are on top of each other. 
Uh, it's actually not been shown in other studies. Pete also pointed out that not only do they get restenosis, but they actually reocclude. So probably a very ineffective approach for those patients. They probably should have gone directly to bypass surgery, I think, in most of these cases. Um, this is another look. Again, this is from John Laird's group at UC Davis, a little, you know, 2013. They looked at their experience with treating uh, instant restenosis in a group of patients that was a subset of their, their own patients that they had stented. And you could see that the type 1, type 2, and type 3 broke out fairly evenly. This is the range of things they tried, pretty much the kitchen sink of endo, with the exception, perhaps, of covered stenting, you know, balloon angioplasty, cutting balloons, atherectomy of all types, cryoplasty, et cetera. Um, here the curves are not, are a little different, right? The class 2 curve is different from class 1. And this is actually a little more what I would expect um, for some of these more diffuse stenoses in a long segment of stent. I don't think it, you know, the results are really not as good as, as the other trial would suggest. But you can see that these failure rates at one year, they're quite appreciable. Um, 50, 60, 70 percent failure rates at one year using treatment from a very good interventional group using a whole range of options and tools that they had at their disposal. So the results are really not that great. We're talking about drug-coated balloons now, but we don't have a lot of data. Again, Pete showed some of this data. This is early data from uh, superficial femoral artery instant restenosis from an Italian group that published using the impact paclitaxel coated balloon and dual antiplatelet therapy is only 39 patients in this study, but it does suggest the possibility that a drug-coated balloon would be an improvement, certainly over plain old balloon angioplasty, although I still don't know how durable this result's going to be when it bears out in, in larger studies. What about putting a drug-eluting stent in? You also already saw this slide from Thomas Zello from the Zilver PTX registry. Again, it's a registry study, but it does look a better than plain old balloon angioplasty. It's 108 lesions. These were reasonable lesions, 13 centimeters long. Uh, they started out as task C and D in about 40 percent. 30 percent were occlusions. They had dual antiplatelet therapy. And you could see, getting out around two years, they had about 50 percent patency. So it's, it probably is better than, than at least historical data. Uh, so, but, you know, it's really not clear exactly yet where the drug-eluting stent is going to fit in. I think if you have a very focal lesion that you're redilating, then, then I think that that might make some sense. But also, you have to think about reference vessel diameter. And then what about coverage stents for this? Well, there is some promising data, but if you really look at it, it's pretty small stuff. Retrospective series, uh, less than 30 patients, most of these. The failure rates look better, you know, 18 to 37 percent, but they're midterm follow-up. I think this can be a useful approach particularly in selected patients uh, who have a certain clinical and anatomic scenario, but I think you have to be very careful. And I think you have to be careful regarding extension and covering collaterals around the knee. And you have to think about what's going to happen to the patient if the Viabon fails, which really could impact their open bypass options, but also could impact them on uh, clinical deterioration in an acute fashion, which is what we have seen in our de novo Viabon data <coughs> Uh, here, we published last year, in fact, bare, uh, bare metal stenting versus stent grafts. Stent grafts do have better patency in our own non-randomized experience, but the concerning thing for us was that about a 10 percent incidence of patients coming back with acute limb ischemia, and that's really not a good thing when you're starting out as a claudicin. We were able to rescue these patients. There were no amputations in this series, but these events were serious, and they required uh, bypass operations in an emergent fashion, thrombolysis. Uh, they were costly, and they were prolonged hospitalization. So think carefully about how you use the technology. It does, I think, offer some benefits in selected situations. So what about doing bypass surgery? I think, you know, what we're concerned about here is that if we push the endovascular first beyond the limits and endovascular second and endovascular third that, you know, in the end, our surgical options are going to be impaired. I think the idea that it's harmless to continue with endo until you really can't anymore is, is probably really flawed. And I think the stakes go up with each intervention, particularly depending on how you're doing it. And I think there is multiple papers coming out that show that as this happens, that bypass done following failed interventions simply doesn't work as well. So it's time for us to uh, get a little more thoughtful about when, it's, when we're going to pick our next treatment. It probably has been past time for that. Now, you would think there'd be a lot of data out there about doing bypass after instant restenosis. I could find one paper that really 
specifically looked at that topic. Maybe it's because it's so common that we don't feel the need to report it separately, but there really isn't very, liter very much literature to talk about here. What I will say is that when you do this, very frequently the inflammation in the artery extends a bit beyond the stent, more than a bit in some cases, and generally it's going to require a below knee anastomosis pretty commonly. I think what, what we can, what we have seen is that multiple endo reinterventions can lead to progressive loss of runoff and more severe ischemia. There's limited data, I think, to suggest that the failure rates may be higher in secondary bypass compared to primary, but that seems to be a trend. Uh, certainly, uh, in all these cases, vein, vein conduit is going to be strongly preferred. And I think no matter what you do, you have to regard these patients as possible restenosers. And the fact that they had a propensity to restenose their stent may not predict their vein graft, but it could. It could be genetic and other predispositions. So these patients, we watch them very carefully no matter what we do. Uh, here's just a few examples. And I think uh, here again, you know, a bypass done around a stent that ended in the SFA probably didn't affect this target too much. This is a small vessel. But if you look here now, we've got stents heading down to the knee joint uh, and you know, bypass now with a single vessel runoff. And I think this is a little more thoughtful here where, you know, we're in this initial treatment, these key collaterals were preserved. You know, I think this is a much better scenario, I would think, for doing this bypass. You're able to go to the above knee pop. You still got some collaterals here. It's a better situation for salvage, but when you're starting to deal with having to go down to the knee joint and below and you've lost collaterals, I think that's stuff we would really rather avoid. So uh, I'll end by just sharing what the way I look at this right now. I think think clinically first, don't think lesion first. If the patient has critical limb ischemia when they represent, I think you have to do something. Clearly, if it's very focal, we're going to think about repeat angioplasty, perhaps with a drug-eluting stent or a drug-coated balloon. I think the class two lesions, the choices are a covered stent versus open bypass. I think when, it's, when the disease extent is, is getting into the popliteal and more advanced tissue loss, open bypass is definitely going to be preferred. There might be situations where it's limited to the SFA and you could consider a covered stent. Uh, but most of the time, when patients are representing with tissue loss, I'm not going to fiddle and diddle anymore. It's time to get them a solution that works and that stays open. Class three lesions, no question in my mind, just go right to open bypass. You don't have time to play games, and if you trash any more of the runoff, you might lose the option to save the leg. Claudication is a whole different story. Again, sit back for a minute and rethink the whole logic for a second. You, get, you gave this patient a procedure to get them to walk better. They've already failed once. You know that their chances of failing again are probably rising. So you got to rethink the whole equation about what you're doing here. Think about the initial treatment length and think about how quickly they failed or how many times they've failed. Think about the initial location and try to avoid extending into the popliteal, particularly the mid and distal popliteal. And also think about whether or not they have contralateral disease you haven't even dealt with. The goal of this is to get them to walk better, not to make a pretty angiogram. So as the risk of that not happening goes up, I think back off. Lesion considerations really are the same as before. Uh, so in a asymptomatic patients, be very selective about doing this. Thanks very much. I'm happy to take any questions.